Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining. I'm Kate Waldock. I'm an assistant professor in the finance area at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, and I also co-host the podcast Capitalisn't with Luigi Zingales. We are delighted today to continue the Stigler Center's Economic Effects of COVID-19 workshop series with Renee Stoltz and Jalan Wang. Please note that we will be recording the presentations, but the Q&A portion in the last 30 minutes is off the record and won't be recorded. So if you have any questions during the presentations, you can submit them by typing them into the Q&A button on Zoom, and I will moderate them in the last 30 minutes of the workshop. Now, please allow me to briefly introduce our presenters. First up, we have Renee Stoltz, who is the Everett D. Reese Chair of Banking and Monetary Economics and the Director of the Dice Center for Research in Financial Economics at The Ohio State University. He's also Director of the Risk of Financial Institutions Group at the NBER and has served as the President of the American Finance Association and as Editor of the Journal of Finance. Today, he will present his paper, How Valuable is Financial Flexibility When Revenue Stops? Evidence from the COVID-19 Crisis. And then after him will be Jalan Wang, who is an Assistant Professor of Finance at the Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests include household finance, fintech, and behavioral economics. She will be presenting her research on bankruptcy and the COVID-19 crisis. So with that, I turn it over to Renee. Thank you, uh, Kate. Um, and thank you to the Stigler Center for giving us the opportunity to present the paper. The paper is how valuable is financial flexibility when revenue stops, evidence from the COVID-19 crisis. And it is co-authored with Rudiger Salenbrach from APFL and the Swiss Finance Institute, and with Kevin Raggett from APFL and the Swiss Finance Institute. The motivation for our paper is straightforward. We wanted to understand the value of financial flexibility. We wanted to understand better the value of financial flexibility. And we define fl financial flexibility as the ease with which a firm can fund a cash flow shortfall. We thought that the COVID-19 shock is a good opportunity to understand flex financial flexibility better because that shock was a very sudden and unexpected loss of cash flow of indeterminate duration for firms. And so what we do is we use stock returns on CDS premiums during March 2020 uh, to provide evidence on the value of financial flexibility when a firm is affected by a large and unexpected revenue shock. This is precisely the type of situation for which firms try to maintain a financial flexibility. Now you might say, well, we already know that financial flexibility is valuable. So what is it that this paper is bringing to the field that we didn't know? Uh, well, one thing that we do um, that is kind of the key of the paper uh, is that we try to measure the value of financial flexibility uh, during that period of time. And so we end up with uh, a quantitative assessment of the value of financial flexibility. We also show how financial flexibility would have been different had the payout policies of firms been different. And lastly, uh, among the three main contributions, uh, we examine whether measures of financial constraints are useful in predicting uh, what, how firms are affected by a shock like the one that happened. Uh, now you might say plenty of papers looked at financial flexibility in the context of the global financial crisis. So why look at it in this context? Well, the COVID-19 crisis is fundamentally different from the global financial crisis. The COVID uh, shock 
starts outside of, of the financial sector uh, and starts on the real side of the economy. It's also a shock that took place very rapidly, uh, whereas the global financial crisis evolved over some period of time. And so this rapidity and the magnitude of the shock uh, make it quite useful to look at uh, stock price reactions, which we do, and to look at the reactions of CDS spreads. Uh, as uh, an illustration of the nature of the shock, uh, you can look at this uh, weekly initial unemployment insurance claims uh, from 1967 uh, to um, uh, the end of April 2020. And you can see that in this figure, uh, you really can't even see the global financial crisis. Now, the thing that, uh, that is quite obvious there is we have a line that is almost flat with except for, I mean, annual seasonality, and then as uh, this very sharp increase uh, in the claims. So uh, in this presentation, I will talk about our sample, uh, and I will talk about our financial flexibility proxies. Then I will describe uh, the hypothesis that we look at, provide some empirical results, and then conclude. We use two samples in the study. Uh, one sample is all US headquartered CompuStack firms, for which we have 2019 data, which are, but, but which are not financial firms and, and are not utilities. And then we look at a subset of firms that were especially affected by the COVID-19 outbreak that are in industries that were especially affected. Um, we, we take this list of the industries from the OECD, uh, but Moody's had a presentation also where they selected industries and they are essentially the same. Uh, and these industries include uh, transportation, uh, construction, retail, hotels, uh, professional and real estate services, and other personal services. Because uh, I have only half an hour, I am mostly going to talk about the whole sample, and I'm not going to talk very much about the subset of firms in the COVID-19 industries. Uh, here we have the evolution of the stock returns, as I'm going to talk about stocks first. Uh, and we look at uh, the stock returns from the beginning of February 2020 uh, to March uh, 24, um, uh, to March 31, 2020. Uh, and we look at two different periods. We look at a period we call the collapse, uh, which is until March 23. And then we look at March 24, which we call stimulus day, for reasons that will become explicit in the next slide. Um, now what you can see is a very sharp downfall. Uh, um, the dotted line, the red dotted line, is the equally weighted uh, returns for the whole sample uh, that we have. Uh, and the black uh, dotted line is for the sample of firms in COVID industries. Now, when I say COVID industries, I mean the industries especially affected by the shock. And you can see that those, the firms in those industries had a greater drop than the other firms in the sample. So we have a period which is from February 3rd to March 23rd, which we call the collapse period. During that period of time, the S&P drops by 31.1%. Uh, and then we have um, the day of March 24. On that day, there is a pretty dramatic change in expectations about approval of a stimulus package. And as a result, uh, there is a sharp increase in uh, stock prices, 
on a decrease in CDS spreads. So I will keep talking about the collapse period, which is from February 3rd to March 23, and I will keep talking about the stimulus day, which is uh, March 24. We use as our dependent variables cumulative log returns, log excess returns, or uh, changes in the CDS premium. For flex financial flexibility proxies, we use our cash holdings on firms holding more cash are more financially flexible. We use firms that have less short-term debt on firms that has, have less long-term debt. So a firm is financially more flexible if it has more cash, less short-term debt, and less long-term debt. We also look at payout policies on uh, more conservative payout policies uh, make firms more flexible. Uh, on the right there, you can see the statistics for those variables. Uh, the one that uh, uh, is maybe the most noteworthy is that short-term debt uh, is relatively small in our sample. Uh, and <coughs> The statistics for cash on long-term debts are probably not surprising. We look at payouts of our assets. We also have results with payouts uh, of a net income. Uh, in terms of the traditional proxies for financial constraints that we examine, uh, obviously we have to have the proxy uh, that was devised by the director of the Stigler Center, namely Luigi Zingales. So we use Capron Zingales. We use the Whited Vu Index, and we use Hadlock on Pierce. Uh, let me now turn to the hypothesis that we look at. Um, now, the first one is that financial flexibility uh, is a relationship between fle financial flexibility on equity value. In the paper, we have uh, uh, a, a small model where we derive those implications, uh, but uh, it's fairly intuitive that firms that are more financial, financially flexible are firms that are in a much better position to replace the loss, loss of cash flow, and therefore they are going to have a smaller stock price drop. The obvious important question and the one we focus on is how much smaller is the stock price drop? Uh, we also discussed in the model uh, the ability of firms to cut costs. Obviously, a revenue stop is less dramatic if the firm can, can cut the costs dramatically. Uh, and so we expect the stock price drop to be less for firms that are better able to cut costs. We also discussed in the paper the implications of having the financial system more stressed. If the system is more stressed, then financial flexibility is going to be more valuable because the firms that are more financially flexible are less likely to have, are less likely to be forced to use the financial system. Uh, with financial constraints, we would expect more financially constrained firms to experience worse uh, equity returns in response to a sudden uh, revenue stop uh, because those firms would not be as able to access the financial system to raise funds to cope with the revenue stop. Lastly, we look at financial flexibility on credit spreads. Um, and we expect the uh, firm's credit spread to increase if there is a sudden revenue stop. Uh, and everything else equal, uh, we expect that increase to be greater for firms that are less financially flexible because those firms become more in danger of defaulting. Let's now turn to the empirical results. Uh, the first table I want to look at is uh, table four. And in that table, we regress the stock returns on our proxies for financial flexibility on, on stock characteristics. 
but we control for stock characteristics in a way that is common in the asset pricing literature. We look, we include equity beta, book to market, the lock of market value, momentum in 2019, and profitability in 2019. So all the characteristics we control for are characteristics for 2019. I, I now turn to the variable of greatest interest here, which are our proxies for financial flexibility. Um, we estimate each regression for the collapse. I mean, we, we estimate um, the results for the collapse period and then for stimulus day. And you can see in uh, the first column that the firms with more cash had higher stock returns during the collapse period. Now, since the, collapse, since the returns were quite negative, it means that they had less negative returns. In uh, the next slide, I will look at the economic significance of those numbers. Um, and then firms with more short-term debt uh, experienced a greater decrease in uh, the stock price. And firms with more long-term debt experienced a greater decrease in the stock price. Uh, now, on stimulus day, uh, the pressures on the financial, financial system were relaxed, and uh, the magnitude of the shock uh, was decreased. Uh, we don't see much of an we don't see an impact for the firms with more cash or firms with more short-term debt, but we see that for the firm with more long-term debt, uh, there was a rebound. In uh, the next regressions, we put all the financial flexibility variables, namely cash, short-term debt, and long-term debt. When we do that, uh, we see that long-term debt uh, is negative and significant. The other variables are, are, not, uh, are not significant. On the stimulus day, all, all variables are positive and significant. This is as expected for short-term debt and long-term debt, but is surprising for cash over assets. Lastly, we look at payout over assets. Uh, you know that there has been much discussion about the role of payouts, uh, and I will talk more about that. Uh, but when we have stock characteristics plus payouts over assets, payout over assets is not significant which is somewhat surprising because now greater payouts lead to less flexibility. Now I turn to controlling as well for firm characteristics. Uh, remember that in uh, my earlier discussion, I said that cost, uh, the ability to cut cost is important. And so we look at uh, cost of goods sold uh, which would be more flexible uh, cost. And we look at sales on general administrative expenses, uh, which would be more fixed cost. Um, so the first regression in that table has the financial flexibility variables as well as uh, proxies for cost. Uh, what we find is that all of the Proxies for financial flexibility are significant. And you can see that the coefficient of a cash of our assets is 0 0.134, uh, which means that one standard deviation of lower cash means a 3.5 percentage points lower return. And we find that short-term debt has a coefficient of minus 0 0.232, which means that one standard deviation higher short-term debt has a lower return of 1.3 percentage point. And finally, a one standard deviation higher long-term debt has a 3.7 percentage point lower return. We also find that greater variable cost is associated with less of a stop drop, as we would expect, and higher fixed cost is associated with a greater stock drop. 
uh, the, on the stimulus, there is the only financial character, uh, flexibility proxy that is related to a term is long-term debt. Then in the last two regressions, instead of using cash and short-term debt separately, we use net short-term debt, which is short-term debt minus cash, and we find uh, similar results. Now, uh, how valuable is financial flexibility? One way to look at that is to compare firms that have high financial flexibility and firms that have low financial flexibility. So for firms with high financial flexibility, we take a firm that is at the 75th percentile of cash holding, at the 25th percentile of short-term debt, and at the 25th percentile of long-term debt. Uh, for low financial flexibility, we take a firm that is at the 25th percentile of cash holding, 75th percentile of short-term debt, and 75th percentile of long-term debt. The difference in cumulative log excess returns between high flexibility firms and low flexibility firms is 9.7 percentage points. So the mean decrease across all firms is 37.8 percentage points, which means that a firm with high financial flexibility experienced a drop in its stock price, which is 26% smaller than a firm with low financial flexibility. We now turn to payout. Uh, now we saw that there was no relation between payouts and stock returns during the collapse period. Um, when we did that, we looked at payouts in 2019. Uh, I said at the time that the result is puzzling, and so we want to try to understand this a lot better. Uh, now payouts were important in the policy debate. As you know, the CARES Act actually restricts our purchases. And there have been many articles in the financial press that uh, discuss the role of strong balance sheets. <clears throat> and so what we do first, we estimate what the cash over assets ratio and the long-term debt over assets ratio would have been at the end of 2019 had firms had no payouts in 2019 or no payouts between 2017 and 2019. So the top panel looks at all firms. Uh, the first two columns that look at what happens if firms had not had payouts in 2019. And you can see that the impact on cash holdings or the impact on long-term debt would be rather small. Now looking at long-term debt, uh, the average for the sample was 0 0.279, so 27.9% of assets for long-term debt. And if firms had had no payouts in 2019, it would be 24.4%. When we turn next, uh, so the last two columns, I look at the impact of removing all the payouts from 2017 to 2019, there, the impact is quite, uh, quite larger. Uh, so no, if for long-term debt, we go from 28.8% to 17.4%. But uh, when we look at the sample as a whole, uh, now the impact uh, doesn't seem that, uh, that overwhelming. On the other hand, when we look at the top quartile of payout ratios, the impact is much larger when we look at the last three years. And the way to see that is if we look at long-term debt. Um, so the average uh, for long-term debt is 31.3%. Uh, so we are looking at the average of long-term debt in the top quartile of the payout firms, of the firms with, of the firms. Now the top quartile of payouts um, if those firms had not had any payouts, they would have been able to pay back all of their debt. Now, so long-term debt would have been negative, which obviously doesn't make sense. It would have been zero. Okay, but it shows the magnitude of the decrease in long-term debts. 
the magnitudes of the payouts was essentially similar to the magnitude of long-term debt. We turn next to uh, the, the role of conglomerates, um, whether they have more financial flexibility, whether being a conglomerate had an impact on the reaction of firms to, uh, to, the, to the crisis. Um, um, now, the reason for that is, if you remember the literature for the global financial crisis, there were some papers that showed that the conglomerate weathered that crisis better. Um, and so we look at that, we look at um, uh, conglomerates for us as firms that are active in multiple Fama French 49 industries. Uh, the bottom line is we find little evidence that the conglomerate form was valuable to, during uh, the collapse period of the crisis. Uh, we have this table uh, nine in the paper where we have an indicator variable for conglomerates. And you see that being a conglomerate doesn't add anything uh, to the financial uh, flexibility proxies. In those regressions, we control for stock characteristics and we control for firm characteristics. Now, uh, hopefully I mentioned that, but if I did not, in all the regressions that I have shown you, we also uh, control for industry. So all the results uh, can be understood as being within industry results. We look next at financial constraints. Um, uh, we use the three indices that I talked about. We also use a different approach of looking at financial constraints which is one developed by Juan and Ritter in a recent paper. And what they do is they look at the firms uh, that would have run out of cash without access to the financial system. Okay, and so you have to make assumptions about their cash flows. And essentially, we assume that the cash flows would be like they were last year. Okay, and so what we find is that the traditional financial constraint proxies have absolutely no useful information about the performance of firms during the collapse period. Uh, the white and woke uh, index actually goes in the opposite way, which is it predicts that more constrained firms behaved better. The one unwritten index is, is useful in the sense that the firms that were got, would run out of cash without recourse to the financial system uh, perform worse. I now turn uh, to the uh, credit spreads. Uh, we use the five-year CDS premiums for an uh, analysis. We have data for 239 sample firms. And we have, here is the evolution of those credit spreads. Uh, and we have them for the whole sample and for the, the firms in the COVID industries. And you can see, not surprisingly, that there is a sharp increase in, in credit spread. Um, and it's sharper for the COVID industries. And you can see that the credit spreads fall after March 23rd. In our regressions, uh, we find that um, firms with more short-term debt and firms with more long-term debt experience a sharper increase in uh, the credit spreads. And we find that a one standard deviation or higher of long-term debt uh, leads to a 107 basis point higher increase in CDS premiums. This increase is quite substantial because the average of our sample is 220 basis point increase. So let me conclude. Uh, so what we look at in the paper is the value of financial flexibility in a unique situation of a sudden and unexpected dramatic revenue shortfall. And we find that the firms with financial flexibility experience a stock price drop that is lower by 26% than those with low financial flexibility. 
We also find that the firms with high financial flexibility experience an increase in CDS premiums that is 176 basis points lower than the increase of firms with low financial flexibility. We find no evidence that firms with higher payouts are affected more adversely by the crisis in our regressions. However, uh, when we look at the firms uh, that have high payouts, uh, we find that had those firms not had the, those payouts for the last three years, uh, their performance would have been better uh, by five per percentage points. Uh, so, uh, kind of the big picture conclusion is now in the last decade, investors and practitioners are focused on the cost of financial flexibility. Um, I also have papers that talk about those costs. Um, um, investor activists uh, campaign to force firms to decrease cash holding and increase cash, increase leverage. Uh, private equity industry has made the reduction of financial flexibility intrinsic to its business model. Uh, what our results show um, is now that financial flexibility is also a key risk, risk management tool um, that uh, we provide evidence on the value of that tool. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for putting this program together and for inviting me to present um, uh, our work on bankruptcy and the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think this um, seminar series by the Stigler Center um, has been so um, fascinating so far and definitely extremely timely and interesting and hopefully informative to policymakers and decision makers as well as the academic community. Uh, so this is co-authored work with Ben Iverson, Ray Klunder, and Jay Yul Yang, who um, will be, uh, you know, hopefully available um, to answer clarifying questions as well, if necessary. And we are also releasing statistics from our analysis publicly um, on the website uh, provided below for anyone interested. So we are, um, in a nutshell, we are tracking um, nationwide bankruptcy filings from both consumers and businesses uh, through, throughout the course of this crisis and trying to, um, to analyze it from an academic lens um, as well as address some uh, potentially very important policy implications uh, as a result of this. So just as some quick motivation, this is the time series of total bankruptcy filings we see in blue uh, since 1980. Um, as well as unemployment claims in green and the total caseload of bankruptcy judges. So caseload as a measure of are the courts congested? So are we reaching capacity of the bankruptcy courts to process these bankruptcy cases? And um, our co-author Ben Iverson has some work suggesting that when the courts become congested um, and here we can think of um, the sort of uh, on the right hand axis, anything above 1000 hours is kind of at capacity. We see that outcomes for companies uh, become worse uh, when the courts become congested. So that is something that in the near term, we might become concerned about. So a couple of takeaways from this graph, we see that, um, that uh, bankruptcies are um, uh, counter cyclical. So it does vary more or less contemporaneously with the unemployment rate. And, you know, as Renee said, and, you know, really the killer graph of this crisis so far is that vertical shoot up um, spike in unemployment rates. Um, and I will show some analysis suggesting that if we extrapolate the um, substantial correlation, I think the correlation is about 0 0.4 between the um, unemployment rate and um, uh, bank uh, is sort of bankruptcy court caseload. So the, the degree of congestion in the court. So if we extrapolate that to that, the vertical spike that we have seen in unemployment, you know, uh, I'm going to show um, in the last section of our results, we're going to have some very alarming um, implications for bankruptcy courts. And, uh, you know, we really need to um, act now if we're going to expand capacity and really be able to process the wave of cases that is likely to occur if um, the historical relationship between unemployment rates um, and uh, court uh, caseloads uh, continues to into this crisis. So why do we think bankruptcy is important? Uh, certainly, you know, as I mentioned, uh, bankruptcy rate is countercyclical and it plays an important role in, in downturns for households. Um, it's, uh, you know, for 
individuals that become unemployed and have lost their cash flow, um, this is, provides a way to provide consumption insurance. For small businesses, which we, you know, many people think are really at the epicenter center of this economic crisis, it allows a formal process for liquidation and reorganization. And in particular, from a general equilibrium perspective, um, the more that the bankruptcy system can potentially try to save and uh, keep in, in business um, uh, these small businesses as going concerns, that can certainly provide a benefit for the economy and not losing all of that organizational capital and those interconnections between firms and their employees. So we certainly uh, expect the demand for these functions will increase um, in the coming months, although we have not seen that just yet. Um, I'll show you the results in our first section. Um, and, you know, the time really is to act now to increase court capacity and avoid uh, court overload, which, you know, in the last crisis, I think our estimates suggest the courts were re really right about at capacity. And of course, unemployment is much, much higher than, than we saw in the last crisis, um, as Renee also showed. Uh, so bankruptcies could have very important macroeconomic consequences. All right, so what are our objectives? What do we do in our paper? We have two key objectives and I'm gonna present evidence on both of those points. So the first point is just to empirically document what is happening to bankruptcy filings. And I'll show you that um, what's happening in the consumer bankruptcy market is very different than what's happening with businesses right now. Um, and to understand, well, if we document are bankruptcies going up or down? Um, what are the mechanisms that are driving those filing rates? And do we think that um, there's barriers to access bankruptcy, that there's individuals and businesses that really should or uh, would like to file for bankruptcy and they aren't able to? Um, or perhaps um, they're making optimal decisions and um, the bankruptcy system is, is working in terms of access to courts. Our second main goal is to forecast uh, future bankruptcy filing rates. And I'll, you know, I'll put out there that, of course, this is highly speculative in that this uh, crisis is very different from any others that we've ever seen. Uh, but to the extent that we can extrapolate from historical, uh, um, historical patterns, um, we're going to try to forecast that relationship between the unemployment rate and potential other leading indicators and court congestion um, to try to provide, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, data points to policymakers to say how many bankruptcy judges do we need if we think that the courts are going to become congested. So what are our initial findings? Uh, so, you know, uh, first a little bit of background about our data. So we are using the universe of all bankruptcy filings in the United States. Um, this comes directly from court administrative records. So for those familiar with bankruptcy, um, the website is called PACER. Um, and this is the actual web system that um, attorneys and actual bankruptcy filers are using to submit their documents. So this is real time information. We can get um, pretty accurate information on cases within about 24 hours of, um, of each individual individual filing. And so what we're going to show is uh, uh, tracing this back to um, January 2019, we can control for typical seasonality. So a lot of what, what I'm going to show is kind of year on year changes once we control for all the seasonality trends relative to 2019. Um, and we can break this down in a pretty disaggregated fashion in terms of the uh, chapter of filing, whether it's a consumer or business, the court, so there's about 90 total bankruptcy courts in the United States, um, as well as the office, so somewhat disaggregated geographic level. Um, and then for the second part of our analysis, when we're trying to predict bankruptcy uh, rates um, and to uh, project how many additional judges we're going to need, uh, we can throw a, a battery of potential leading indicators out, out there. I'm going to show you evidence from Google Trends. Um, our primary variable that we're currently relying on is the unemployment rate, which, as I said, is highly correlated with the um, uh, court congestion, but there's a lot, uh, a lot of other potential uh, factors we can bring in, and I welcome any suggestions from the audience in the Q&A section. So uh, for our first piece of analysis, just, you know, what is happening to bankruptcy filing rates? Uh, our key finding so far is that we're seeing um, consumer bankruptcies declined quite dramatically, about 50% year on year um, in the month of April. But we are seeing some signs of rebound in the last couple of weeks. So I think May has had, um, you know, maybe two and a half full weeks so far. Um, we're seeing potentially rebound to, uh, to expected rates. And potentially, I think we're all expecting, all bankruptcy scholars are expecting a wave of, of filings to come. 
the takeaway is that has not come yet for either consumers or businesses. Business filings thus far have been more or less on trend compared with 2019. So one thing I want to put out front um, in this, you know, there may be some uh, misconceptions out there is that there are bankruptcies going on. So it is the case that the basically I think all bankruptcy courts are uh, physically shut down. However, as I will show you, there are still thousands and thousands of bankruptcies going on every single week. So it's definitely not the case that um, physical constraints um, and physical uh, you know, quarantine are preventing all bankruptcies from occurring. Certainly, it could be the case that uh, this makes it harder, especially if we imagine um, individuals and businesses that uh, don't have very good access to the internet um, uh, and don't, you know, don't have the money to pay for an attorney, there could certainly be barriers to access. And that's something that we do want to worry about. However, um, you know, I want to put out there that even though um, the vast majority of courts have issued orders such as the one I'm showing here um, of districts being held telephonically, I assume that also includes Zoom, um, uh, um, it's not the case that the court is simply completely shut down and that that accounts for the decline in filings that we see. So why would we be seeing, you know, we, we from a policy perspective, um, if this decline in bankruptcy, uh, consumer bankruptcy filings, it, so I'll just show you really quickly, this is the raw data. So we see um, sort of in uh, basically the month of April, uh, we see a pretty, you know, visible decline. And, um, you know, when we control in a regression framework, that's about a 50% year on year decline in total bankruptcy filing rates. Um, you know, from a policy perspective, Maybe we're not too concerned if that's a totally temporary drop in April only, and all of those bankruptcies are just going to be shifted intertemporally to May or June. That probably doesn't have huge welfare implications. But if that decline in consumer bankruptcies um, is evidence that um, a lot of individuals are facing barriers that you know, want to file for bankruptcy but are not able to, uh, either because of physical constraints of the courts being shut down, lack of access to the internet, lack of uh, liquidity, uh, which some of uh, my past work has shown, uh, liquidity constraints does seem to have a significant impact on bankruptcy filing. Um, we you know, certainly would worry about that. If it's, certainly, if it's simply a reflection of rational decision-making, either uh, you know, thinking about optionality and, and uncertainty, or the fact that substitutes to bankruptcy are expanding. So the, uh, you know, there's been a huge expansion in social insurance programs such as uh, unemployment insurance, lender forbearance on uh, foreclosures and evictions, um, and many types of loans, that might not be as much of a concern. So we want to kind of understand what is driving the decline in bankruptcy filing rates, and does that have a welfare implication? Okay, I'm going to skip through this. So one piece of very um, suggestive or anecdotal evidence um, is that we think that Google searches for bankruptcy would probably be correlated on the demand side for bankruptcy. So if we saw uh, searches for bankruptcy shoot way up, but actual bankruptcies go down, that might be concerning and that people are la uh, lacking access to the courts. So here on the left-hand side graph of searches for the file for bankruptcy, we did see a big decline in April consistent with the decline in actual bankruptcies that we find. So, but, you know, we, we saw a subsequent very large increase, so that might foreshadow um, the spike in bankruptcies that all of us um, have sort of been expecting and waiting for. So it's very possible, and I think what we're expecting here is um, that the decline in bankruptcies in April is going to be short-lived. Another piece of evidence, another reason why um, we might see a decline in consumer bankruptcies is that actual delinquencies on consumer debt have gone down. And a lot of this might be um, those lender forbearance programs that we've seen um, through things like uh, Fannie and Freddie mortgages, student loans, et cetera. Okay, so this is just uh, re reiterating um, our evidence on the first question of what is happening to actual bankruptcy rates. So here I'm, um, the raw data is here, so consumer, visibly gone down. Um, business, you know, there's a lot of noise here in that large uh, businesses such as Sears and Kmart have a huge number of su subsidiaries, but even in a regression framework, the business filings are essentially unchanged from 2019. Um, so we can um, throw a regression framework in there to essentially control for every single type of seasonality, including day of the week, day of the month, uh, month of the year, as well as um, the district um, of each bankruptcy filing. And so when we throw in the regression framework, which um, you know, gets rid of a lot of the noise that we saw in the raw data, 
Um, and these are event studies of the dates of court shutdown. So this is essentially asking the question, is it the case that the physical shutdown of actual bankruptcy courts drives the timing of the decrease in uh, bankruptcies that we're seeing? Um, so we do see some evidence that this is the case, but there are some pre-trends. So essentially um, the modal date that uh, bankruptcy courts closed down physically was in mid-March. So we can think of the red line here, day zero, as like March 15th uh, or so. And so we can see uh, it's been about two months since then. So looking at the daily patterns, we see that pretty big decrease. So the top row is the level, the number of bankruptcies per day per court. And in logs, we see the percentage change go down to about 50% decline and now starting to go back up um, you know, even in the last month or so uh, post shutdowns. So, you know, we're seeing some evidence of rebounding bankruptcy rates already. So I'm gonna spend a lot of the rest of my time talking about uh, an important policy implication um, of the wave of bankruptcies that we would expect given the huge increase in unemployment rates, um, which is forecasting core congestion. And in this section, essentially, we're trying to answer the question, um, if the historical pattern holds, how many more bankruptcies uh, judges are we gonna need? So first of all, um, is the court gonna become capacity constrained? Um, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, how, how constrained will it be? How many new bankruptcy judges are we gonna need um, on a per district level? Um, and that's a pretty concrete takeaway for policymakers to really, um, you know, it shouldn't be that hard to expand the number of bankruptcy judges. But if we're gonna do that, as we saw, bank, the, the wave of bankruptcy filings hasn't kind of struck us yet, but you know, kind of the time is, is now uh, to act to expand capacity if we can do it. So how do we go about this exercise? So I'm gonna present a really, really um, simple version um, of this forecasting exercise. So what we're gonna do is use weights, um, and I think this is the only known study of judge time use um, and caseloads. So unfortunately, it was from um, about 30 years ago in 1991. Um, and so maybe another follow on is for someone, maybe us, to, uh, to update this study because so much has changed, including a very, very major change to bankruptcy law in 2005. Um, so, you know, I think this is the best that we uh, have right now, but hopefully um, it at least provides a ballpark estimate. So we're essentially, um, these weights that I show um, on the table on the right hand side of this graph is um, a proxy for the number of hours a judge has to spend per bankruptcy case. And so we see obviously that chapter 11 cases um, are gonna take much more of a judge's time, um, but of course they're much rarer than consumer cases. So um, more or less um, the breakdown nationwide is about 50-50 between the amount of time that judges nationwide have to spend on consumer cases versus uh, business chapter 11s. Uh, because you know there's so many more consumer cases, but the chapter 11s take so much more time. But of course, this is very heterogeneous across districts. So many corporations are headquartered in uh, places like Delaware or the New York Southern District. So, so that's why we're going to do this forecasting exercise from uh, on a district by district level. And of course, constraints occur on the district level as well. Is that if North Dakota has an excess of bankruptcy judges, it's not necessarily straightforward that they can simply uh, costlessly send those judges to Delaware. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, capa excess capacity in one bankruptcy district doesn't necessarily alleviate any constraints in other districts. Uh, so roughly 50% of judge time is spent on bankruptcy cases um, and the other 50% is spent on other types of cases and administrative work. So more or less what we, our benchmark for um, the courts being at capacity is about 50 hours per week of judge time or 25 hours per week um, on cases and we extrapolate 25 hours on other types of, um, of work that judges have to do. Okay. So how do we do this forecasting exercise? We're really gonna do this um, a, a first pass in the simplest possible uh, way. So um, on a, an annual uh, level, we're gonna estimate caseload by the total hours spent uh, divided by the number of judges. So this is the number of hours per judge using those 1991 weights that I showed. Um, and you know, I think a lot of our estimates um, for various reasons that I'll go into are probably ver fairly conservative. Um, our, are fairly kind of, uh, we can think of as lower bounds for the degree to which bankruptcy courts are gonna become congested 
Um, in particular, we're, uh, um, our exercise that I'm going to show is based on a 15% unemployment rate, which is our current unemployment rate as of April. So if we expect the unemployment rate to rise in the rest of the year, um, this is, our estimates certainly provide a lower bound as well. Um, another reason is that we're using 1991 weights, and because BAPSIPA, the 2005 uh, law change that significantly changed the bankruptcy system, um, imposed quite a few um, additional requirements, we think that probably but judges have to spend more time today than they did in 1991. Uh, how many judges do we currently have? We have about 350 judges, 18 of which are temporary, um, and each judge is appointed for a five-year term. The number of judges is determined by Congress um, and has been roughly constant over time, despite the graph that I showed you um, that shows that um, kind of the caseload. So this is just another version of the graph I showed at the very beginning um, of the unemployment rate in red and uh, judge caseload. So certainly caseload varies, but the number of judges um, has not changed very much over time. Um, for example, in the last time the number of judges was expanded was in 2017, um, and that uh, you know, added four additional judgeships. So another caveat that, that I'll put forward is that trustees really are likely to play a very, very important role, especially for the small business cases that um, we're likely to see going forward. Um, but um, our analysis simply doesn't, doesn't speak very much to that, and, hope, and that might be a direction for, for future research. Um, Okay, so yeah, this just shows again the unemployment relationship between the unemployment rate and judge caseload. So as of April 2020, um, our current unemployment rate is 14.7%. Um, and so the question, you know, going forward, we're going to basically use that benchmark to ask us, um, you know, more as we see more or less um, the bankruptcy rate um, moves contemporaneously uh, with the unemployment rate. Um, so if we're just going to go with that 15% number, how many additional bankruptcy judges are we going to need? Um, and so a lot of questions arise as to the extent to which the CARES Act, which was passed in late March, or the next wave of stimulus will, um, you know, change that relationship. Certainly that's a huge caveat that should be put on the, um, you know, uh, in the background of this analysis. So the, um, the horizontal line here is our reference point of roughly 50 hours per week that we think is representative of the courts being at full capacity. And so we see in 2010, the courts were just below, and, you know, bankruptcy courts since 1980 have not really fully reached kind of the capacity, uh, capacity benchmark. But the real question is, are they going to? Uh, okay, so this is the uh, time series relationship. So in the cross section, we also see a very, very strong relationship between the unemployment rate and uh, the um, bankruptcy court caseload at the district level. So again, um, larger states have multiple bankruptcy courts. So there's about 90 total bankruptcy courts in the United States. So we see a very clear relationship between um, in the cross section uh, in the last crisis. So I always have to, um, you know, kind of correct myself when I say the crisis now, because now we can't simply say the crisis uh, to refer to the 2008 financial crisis, um, since now we're in another one. Um, but this basically shows the unemployment rate in the first quarter of 2010 relative to the caseload in hours per week uh, contemporaneously. So again, we see these two things move roughly contemporaneously. Um, and so if we're going to see a wave of bankruptcies, history suggests that's going to happen soon. Um, a few key takeaways from this graph. So we see a couple of outliers on the right-hand side of that graph at unemployment rates about 15%. So back in 2010, uh, the Michigan Eastern District, uh, which includes Detroit, and the California Eastern District were the only districts that had unemployment rates about the level that we see now. Um, and there's very large heterogeneity in caseloads across districts. So um, even though on a national level, as I just showed, we weren't really at capacity, one third of bankruptcy districts were above the 50 hours per week. And uh, administratively, it's not trivial for a judge to simply go to another bankruptcy court. Um, so some rural areas based on this cross-sectional evidence such as Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa were still well under capacity and it's likely that um, some areas even in today's crisis will remain under capacity but we, we worry and I'll show you evidence on you know which courts uh, seemed like they're, they're uh, poised to kind of become congested. 
Okay, so our back of the envelope forecasting exercise uh, for each year and district and bankruptcy type, we're gonna simply calculate the relationship, uh, essentially an elasticity between the number of unemployed individuals and the number of bankruptcy filings. And this accounts for very significant heterogeneity across courts and what types of cases that they process. Um, and we take the average across years um, while removing the 2005 to 2006 period when um, the BAPSIPA reform took place. Um, and then we're just gonna extrapolate that onto the district by district unemployment rate um, as of April 2020. So essentially we're gonna ask the hypothetical question, if every bankruptcy district um, experienced a 15% unemployment rate um, in the second quarter of, of this year, what would we expect the caseload to be in each district and how many additional judges would we need? So what are the findings from the, this back of the envelope forecasting exercise, which um, you know, I will admit I found uh, quite alarming. Um, so you know, we know that uh, bankruptcies are roughly contemporaneous, so we're, we're gonna expect to see these results soon. Um, so what, we, what do we find? Um, 11 out of the 89 bankruptcy districts seem to already have enough judges to keep up with capacity, uh, assuming a 15% unemployment rate. And again, um, we're seeing this largely in rural areas, um, Alaska, um, uh, Wyoming, North Dakota, et cetera. Uh, but on the other side, 22 out of the 89 bankruptcy courts, um, we estimate would require um, at least five new judges. Um, so this is, you know, probably on the order of the number that they currently have. So nine, um, and this is fairly geographically dispersed across the U.S., so nine districts in the South, five in the Southwest, and four in the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic. And, and even more alarmingly, um, uh, I think about five districts, we estimate need 10 or more additional bankruptcy judges. Uh, so in total nationwide, we estimate that we're gonna need 300 more bankruptcy judges um, conditional on a 15% um, unemployment rate in each district. And so this compares to uh, the 350 bankruptcy judges we currently have. Uh, so I think I'm certainly alarmed. I think our research group is a little bit alarmed by these back of the envelope calculations. So I think I already went through all of the, you know, probably the caveats to this um, analysis, but nonetheless, we think we've done the best we can given the information we currently have. Um, certainly we can add more predictive variables uh, to the, um, you know, kind of to the forecasting exercise. But as we see, the unemployment rate is already highly, um, highly predictive. One other thing that I, I really want to note before closing, uh, um, closing our presentation is that 65% of bankruptcy judges are over 60 years old. Um, so it's probably the case that the typical bankruptcy judge is not going to be able to simply expand their labor supply to just work 80 or 100 hours per week um, to cope with the influx of bankruptcy cases. Uh, and they also um, sadly are, are in a high risk group for the COVID-19 medical crisis um, itself. Uh, so, you know, certainly we are alarmed and, you know, the final caveat I'll just reiterate is, uh, and, you know, I'll also note that even if we act today, if Congress um, acted today to double the number of bankruptcy judges, um, it may not, uh, you know, it, it, it may not come in time to to fully cope with the wave of um, of cases because obviously a new judge coming in they, there's a lot of things to learn and they won't necessarily be able to handle a 100% full caseload right away um, and of course the final caveat is that unemployment may exceed 15% um, and may currently already exceed 15% that we use for our calculations. So um, I think that more or less wraps up. I'm not gonna go through the vector autoregression um, uh, analysis that we did that kind of um, supports our, our back of the envelope calculations, but I'll just sort of conclude um, uh, and say thank you very much for all the audience members for, uh, for uh, being with us today. And you can follow our work. Uh, we tr we're trying to post relative to up-to-date um, indicators on bankruptcy as well as other uh, consumer and small business um, markets on this website and, uh, and also on Twitter. Uh, so thank you so much.